Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with an update on the current situation in Spain. Day 210 of the current situation and the saga continues here in Spain. The power battle continues between the central government and the Madrid government and things reached new heights yesterday with a state of alarm or a state of emergency situation being imposed on the Madrid community. More about that in a minute. Firstly, a big thanks to people that supported the channel through a small donation. You can see your name here. Thanks to people that bought merchandise and a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon for your support. Now, as I mentioned in yesterday's video, things here in Spain at the moment, a little bit confusing, a little bit difficult to understand what is exactly going on. People in Madrid especially, it's difficult for them to understand. They woke up on Thursday morning in a confinement situation with restrictions. They went to bed on Thursday evening with those restrictions having been quashed. Again, they woke up on Friday thinking that they were free, getting ready for their long weekend. And then by Friday afternoon, the restrictions were back and people in Madrid found themselves in a state of emergency in a confinement situation and with mobility restrictions. So a little bit confusing in the capital city at the moment. We can see here that Spain has imposed a state of emergency on Madrid. The Spanish government has ordered a 15-day state of emergency to bring down COVID-19 infection rates in the capital after a court overturned a partial lockdown imposed a week ago. Madrid and nearby cities will see restrictions enforced by 7,000 police. The capital has also been at the center of a political row, with the center-right city authorities challenging the socialist-led government's demands. Cases are down and the state of emergency is unjustified, say city officials. Madrid Health Minister Enrique Ruiz Escudero insisted that measures already in place were working and that the national government order was a measure no madrileño will understand. So everything a little bit confusing at the moment and as we saw there, measures that no madrileño will understand. A little bit confusing. And of course, the Madrid government is not happy that the central government has imposed itself on the community. And we can see here that the president of the Madrid community, Ms. Ayuso, has rejected the state of alarm and insists on implying a model of selective restrictions. The community is committed to carrying out a control through the basic health areas. So with these new restrictions in Madrid, what can people living in the city do and what can't they do? Well, the rules are the same as they were at the beginning of the week. People are allowed to move around in Madrid. They're allowed to go shopping. They're allowed to go to school. They're allowed to go to their place of work. They're allowed to leave the confined area also if they have to go to work or study. So similar to the rules that were in place earlier in the week. And of course, the Spanish central government has imposed these restrictions in order to stop people leaving the capital city because this weekend is a long weekend here in Spain. Monday is a public holiday and the central government was worried that people were going to flee the city go to second homes, go to second residences, go to their villages, go to their towns, and of course, take the virus with them. So that is one of the main reasons for the central government imposing that state of alarm on Madrid or that state of emergency as we saw before. Now, this is the first time during the pandemic that the central government has imposed the state of alarm on a particular area in Spain. Of course, the state of alarm was nationwide in the months of March, April, and May, but now it is only for the Madrid community. And according to one newspaper, the Prime Minister, Mr. Sanchez, will only be able to maintain the state of alarm in Madrid for 15 days. He wants to avoid having to take the measure to Congress where he does not have sufficient guarantees to extend it. The city of Madrid closes despite being the ninth city in Spain in fatality rates, the eighth in infection rates, and the second in incidence of cases and mortality. Now, I just mentioned that this weekend is a long weekend here in Spain, and one of the big worries, as I said, was that the government thought that many people were going to try and leave Madrid and go to those other places around Spain. That was one of their main concerns. And yesterday, long traffic jams were recorded at Madrid exits, coinciding with the entry into force of the state of alarm for coronavirus. Now, I don't know how many people were able to leave the city yesterday, able to leave for the long weekend. Of course, there was a big police presence on the highway, trying to stop people going away for the long weekend or going away for the bridge, as they call it here in Spain. In Spain, the term for long weekend is puente. And lots of other towns and cities and villages around Spain were worried about the influx of people from Madrid this weekend. We can see here that Cáceres and other cities will control that people who escape from the state of alarm in Madrid do not arrive in their areas. From students who have taken the opportunity to return home for a few days 
to those who have gone directly to the beach to spend this long weekend, many are the people from Madrid who have tried to leave the region in the last few hours. To prevent the arrival of people from Madrid, some cities, such as Cáceres in Extremadura, have announced controls at the entrances to the town. So there we can see some cities around Spain trying to stop people from Madrid arriving this weekend by putting up controls at the entrances to the city. So people from Madrid, definitely personas non gratas here in Spain at the moment. Now let's have a look at the health situation here in Spain at the moment with the map and graph from El Confidencial newspaper. We can see here in the graph on the right the evolution of diagnosed cases and deaths on a seven-day average. And down the bottom we can see the last seven days case numbers are up 5.92% at 57,247. Hospitalizations are up 1.89% at 5,917. And deaths are up 28.50% at 541 on previous reported data. Now it's important to see the hospital situation here in Spain at the moment or the pressure on the hospital system. And we can see here that Madrid, Castilla, Leon and La Rioja are the regions with the most saturated ICUs by the coronavirus in Spain. And if we have a look at a map of the country of the hospital pressure because of COVID in the autonomous communities, we can see the different color schemes around the country. If we have a look at some particular areas, for example, Madrid, we can see the total amount of hospitalizations. We can see the amount of people in the ICU units. We can also see the saturation rates of the hospitals. For example, the total amount of COVID patients in Madrid at 20.61% and in the ICUs 39.33%. In Castilla y León, we can also see the hospital situation there. COVID patients accounting for 14.06% and in the ICU, 31.06%. In La Rioja, just under 10% of hospitalizations are COVID patients and in the ICU units, they are 30%. And if we compare those figures to a less affected region, for example, Galicia, we can see the situation there in the hospitals, 271 COVID patients, 39 in the ICUs, and the hospital saturation there is 3.34% total, and in the ICUs, 5.48. So Madrid, Castilla, Leon, and La Rioja, the main areas in Spain where the hospital situation is not very good at the moment. Now, we all know that Spain suffered one of the most severe lockdowns in Europe, if not the world, earlier in the year. The months of March, April and May, there was a very severe lockdown here in Spain. And of course, there was lots of talk on just how effective lockdowns are and what the long-term effects are on the population. We can see here that a tide of scientists subscribe to the fact that lockdowns are harmful. More than 17,000 experts from around the world warn of the negative effects of general closure and propose a model focused on the vulnerable. Current containment policies are having devastating short and long-term effects on public health. The consequences, to name a few, include lower vaccination rates, worsening cardiovascular disease, fewer cancer detections, and deteriorating mental health, leading to higher excess mortality rates in the years to come, with the working class being and the younger members of society, those who bear the greatest burden of these measures. With these words, three epidemiologists created a manifesto against the confinement of the population as a measure to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So the general thought from these scientists is that lockdowns do more harm than good. I wish we had have known that back earlier in the year. Now let's have a look at some of the comments from previous videos. First one here from Sean regarding timetables. I think that the Spanish manage it with their famous siesta. Although most believe the siesta to be due to the extreme heat, totally absent in winter time, I think that it is much more likely that it is due to the fact that many Spaniards sleep five or six hours a night and catch up on their sleep in the afternoon before they go back to work. I have lived in tropical areas in Mexico and the siesta is not part of the culture, despite the intense heat and humidity. People just go to bed at 11 or 12 and get up at 7 or 8 because of the late night dining and going out to drink after that, which is such an important part of Spanish culture. Simply doesn't exist in other places around the world, including most of Latin America. Spain is quite a unique place. Yes, Sean, thanks for the comment. You're right, Spain is a unique place, especially when it comes to timetable and especially when it comes to uh, dining times and things around going out late at night. Spain does seem to be different. I mentioned the other day, for example, the nightly news here doesn't start until 9 p.m., finishes at around 10, and of course, all of the primetime shows start around 10.30, and they can finish quite late. 
And to be completely honest, I'm a huge fan of the siesta. I think it's a very, very good idea if you can manage it well. Maybe not to sleep for too long, but just a 10, 15, 20 minute nap in the afternoon is a great idea. You can see over here I have my couch, and that is where you will find me most afternoons, around four, half past four, having a brief siesta before I get up, start work again, or go and pick up my son from school and get on with my afternoon activity. So uh, as I said, I'm a big fan of the siesta. One here from Kung Zhu. How exactly do you create 800,000 jobs? If there was scope for that many new jobs in a country, you'd be living in a utopia. Yeah, Kung Zhu, thanks for the comment. To be honest, I don't know how you create that many jobs, but that is the plan that Mr. Sanchez has in this country. He's going to use those European funds to create a huge amount of jobs, apparently, and lots of people are rubbing their hands with glee, waiting to get one of those jobs. However, there are some skeptics out there. I mentioned yesterday Today that I'm a little bit skeptical about whether or not this can be achieved. 800,000 jobs is a lot. And I've heard it before from socialist prime ministers in this country. I heard it back in the day with the famous Mr. Zapatero. He also promised lots and lots of jobs and they never arrived. He also said that every child in Spain at school was going to get a laptop computer. Didn't see that either. So there's lots of promises made, but very few politicians are able to put those promises into practice, unfortunately. One here from Alfredo. Hello there, Stuart. It looks like everything was in shambles before and it's in flames now. In Spanish, we say, I de la sartén al fuego. Yeah, Alfredo, thanks for the comment. I think in English, we have a similar expression from the frying pan into the fire. So uh, good to see that we share those two expressions in both languages. And uh, you're right, everything did seem to be in a bit of a shambles before. The country took a long time to recover from the last economic crisis. And this one, the timing, in my opinion, is not very good. And you can get the impression that the fire is starting to rage out of control. But as we saw before, there's lots of secondary effects of this pandemic, and no doubt the economy will be one of those. But uh, better not to think too much about it, because it might affect my mental health, and that's the last thing that I want. One here from Dani Andres. In Spain, politicians basically talk and talk and argue a lot, but they rarely do proper work or get things done. Many of them finished their high school years, joined a political party, and never even worked in the private sector. Most of them are basically useless. It's that bad. After seven years in office, Mariano Rajoy couldn't speak English with the minimum fluency. Pedro Sanchez speaks slightly better English than the average B2 first student, but worse than the average C1 advanced. And he's got a very strong accent too. He's just another unprepared Spanish president. But hey, one thing thing Spanish politicians know how to do is steal taxpayers' money. Yeah, Danny, thanks for the comment. And that's also been one of my bugbears over the years that now we have these professional politicians, people that leave high school or university, go straight into a political party and have no experience in the real world. How can we expect politicians to take decisions in a real world when they don't have real world experiences, like, for example, running businesses or working in a nine to five job? They go into these political parties, these political bubbles, and they know very well how those systems work. They know exactly what they need to do. And unfortunately, it can mean that they don't take very good decisions. One example of politicians not really knowing what happens in the real world was a few years ago, a Spanish prime minister was asked what the price of a cup of coffee was. And he said that it was around 70 cents instead of the real price that you pay for a coffee here in Spain of about one euro 20 or one euro 30 back when he made those comments. So uh, he was a little bit out of touch with the real world. And you're right, foreign languages are not really the strong point of politicians here in Spain, but I don't think Boris Johnson is fluent in many languages either. And Australian politicians obviously are not language experts either. So I don't really hold that against them. But if you want to have a good laugh, check out the former Prime Minister, Mr. Athnar, speaking English at Georgetown University. One here from Hike Ranger. Hello, Stuart from Arizona. I love Spain and have been hiking trails all over the country for many years. I'm planning to purchase a small place either around the Malaga area or even out on the Canary Islands. Any pointers to help find a reputable real estate agency to help out in this international situation? P.S. Love your channel. 
Yeah, thanks for the comment, Hike Ranger. It's a very popular pastime here in the country, hiking. You see lots of people out and about at weekends hiking around the mountain areas, hiking on the different tracks around the country. Here in Madrid, for example, lots of people go to the Sierra, to the mountain range to the north of the country to practice hiking activities. And even around here, you can see lots of people hiking. So Spain is a good country if you are a hiker. And to be honest, I don't really know of any reputable real estate agents in either the Canary Islands or Andalusia, but I'm sure that there are people watching the video and they'll be able to help you out and help you find a good real estate agent in either Andalusia or the Canary Islands. So uh, if you know of anyone, leave it in the comment section below. One here from Simple Future. Thank you so much for everything. We have to go next year in July to Galicia. We hope that everything will be fine. Yes, yeah, Simple Future, thanks for the comment, and I hope you're able to get to Galicia next July. Not really sure what the situation is going to be like then, but hopefully it's going to be better than it is now, and that you are able to travel and enjoy your time in Galicia. On that note, I'll start to wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the situation out as you normally do. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.